Diesel locomotives, they power the world. Without them, all this wouldn't be possible. But what makes a diesel locomotive tick? How do they work? And what are the different types of diesel locomotives? In this series, we're gonna cover all three main types and how they get power from the engine to the wheels. In the previous video, we covered the operation of diesel electric locomotives and their dynamic brakes. Today, we'll be looking at diesel mechanical locomotives. While they ain't nearly as popular as the diesel electric type, they're definitely more interesting. These types of engines are usually slow and small, and typically handle lower power jobs such as switching or passenger transport in the form of self-propelled rail cars. There have been experiments with diesel mechanical road locomotives, but they just didn't catch on, and you'll know why by the end of this video. Several models of diesel mechanical locomotives even have a resemblance to steam engines because of their external drive gear. Unlike diesel electric locomotives, that are popular all over the world. Diesel mechanical locomotives seem to be most popular in Europe, and it makes sense. Europe doesn't always have mile-long megatrains that places like North America, Australia, or Africa do. So there's lots of rail yards where locomotives of lower power can be reliably used to build trains. The power flow through a diesel mechanical locomotive is actually very similar to that of a car with an automatic transmission. At the heart of the locomotive, you have the diesel engine, which provides all the power in the form of high torque and low RPMs. The power comes from the engine and goes into a fluid coupling or one or more torque converters, depending on the locomotive model. The power then goes into a transmission of some kind, into the final drive, and finally into the wheels. In some models, the output of the engine goes directly into the transmission but for most diesel mechanical locomotives, there's a fluid coupling between the output shaft of the engine and the input shaft of the drivetrain. This fluid coupling is extremely interesting. Inside, there's two discs with fins on them. They sit very close to one another, but do not touch. They're in an extremely confined space. In fact, the casing that surrounds them almost touches them. The disc being driven by the engine is called the impeller, and the disc connected to the output shaft is called the turbine. Both of these components are submerged in a thick fluid that's almost always oil of some kind. The impeller works like a pump, generating massive amounts of flow in the oil. All the moving oil pushes on the turbine, making it rotate. It takes a bit of time for the turbine to match the speed of the impeller, so there's usually a slight lag between increasing the throttle and the locomotive actually accelerating. Since the oil in these fluid couplings is practically incompressible, nearly all the torque being generated by the engine is transferred through the fluid, into the turbine, and therefore into the output shaft. The fluid coupling also acts like an automatic clutch. Some locomotive models were equipped with one or more torque converters in place of a fluid coupling. Torque converters work similarly to a fluid coupling, but are a bit more complex. In some models, the fluid in the torque converters would be drained out when the RPMs of the engine's output shaft and the transmission input shaft matched, creating a direct drive between the engine and transmission. But those kinds of models weren't all that successful. The gearbox, or transmission, is what allows the wheels to spin faster or slower than the engine without ever changing the engine's speed. The transmission uses gear ratios to achieve this. What's really interesting is that the gears are changed manually by the engineer with the use of a shift lever, just like how it's done in a car. But there's no clutch pedal to push down on because the fluid coupling we just discussed acts as an automatic clutch for the locomotive. Now, there are practically countless variations and models of transmissions in these locomotives. And if we tried to cover every one, it would be like trying to cover every type of manual automotive transmission in one video, and we'd be here till next Tuesday. So I'm just going to give y'all a basic rundown of how a manual transmission works, using this 13-speed out of a semi. 
Don't worry about the locomotive's transmission being fully synchronized or not. That's going to be model specific. What matters here is the action of changing gear ratios, because that's ultimately what's happening inside every diesel mechanical locomotive. It's also important to note that locomotives typically only have four speeds, not ten or more like semi-trucks do. This is your input shaft, where power comes into the transmission. This is your range box with low, intermediate, and direct. It attaches to the output shaft, and is essentially a simple secondary transmission. These are your counter shafts, and these are your collars, which lock and unlock gears. Let's put the transmission in first gear. With the range box in low, I'm going to slide this collar into gear 1. This locks the gear to the shaft it's sitting on. Now, power is flowing through the transmission like this. You've got a small gear driving a big gear, and the same thing is happening inside the range box, making for high torque and low speeds. Now, let's put the transmission in second. I'm going to slide that same collar back, unlocking first, and slide this collar into this gear, locking it, and putting the transmission in second. You've still got a small drive gear and a big driven gear, but the difference between them is diminished, making for slightly less torque and slightly higher speeds. And nothing changes yet in your range box. That happens once you get to third gear. For the transition from third to fourth, you have to put your range box in intermediate. This unlocks the gear connections that transmit power in there and locks the input shaft of the range box to the output shaft of the transmission. It stays like that until you get into eighth gear. And then you put your range box in high for gears nine through 13. This is the kind of stuff that's happening inside the locomotive transmission, and some models can even have more than one. As complex as this looks, this 13 speed is actually a very simple transmission. Things can get way more complicated from here, but this is what it takes to change gear ratios while in motion. After power flows through the transmission, it goes to the final drive, which is a lot simpler. On some locomotives, the final drive is just a set of bevel gears. On others, there are planetary sets, which multiply torque and better distribute load. But the most common final drive seems to be a rod connecting all or some of the wheels, just like what a steam locomotive would have. So, after seeing all this, I'm sure you can start to see why diesel mechanical locomotives ain't as popular as their diesel electric counterparts. The railroad doesn't like moving parts, and these locomotives are full of them. With all these moving parts, there's a lot of room for error, misassembly, failure, and friction, and that's part of the reason why they're limited to low speeds. All these moving parts in there generate heat, and if those gears and bearings get too hot or stressed, well, things go south pretty quickly. There's also a lot of wear and tear on the gears, especially when pulling heavy things such as rail cars. Maintenance on diesel mechanical locomotives is also time consuming. If you're rebuilding just one final drive assembly, you've got to set proper preload on the tapered roller bearings, adjust your gear lash, and make sure you got proper in play on all the shafts and all of the specs you're dealing with are measured in thousandths of an inch, or micrometers I should say, since Europe is where these engines are most popular. But that's just for gear powered final drives. I can't imagine what goes into setting up and maintaining rod powered ones. There's also the strength and longevity of the materials. Those gears, splines, and clutches are gonna wear out over time and replacing them ain't easy. Now. Is that to say that diesel mechanical locomotives are worthless or bad? No, absolutely not. When maintained properly, they're some of the most reliable things out there, easily more reliable than diesel electric locomotives. They will work wonderfully and last forever when used properly, but because of the nature of their operation, it's hard for them to be a jack of all trades. Thanks for watching. If y'all enjoyed this video, consider checking out some other ones of mine. Also, maybe pass yourself by the merch shop. We've got a new design that's hopefully coming out soon. Anyways, till next time.